you are listening to another episode of Climbing on the Bookshelf. In June last year, I was a podcast sceptic and only really listened to the radio until I started to work again after the first lockdown. I was up and down ladders uh, for the most for probably about two months, so listening to the radio, I could kind of hear it and sometimes not, so there was kind of no point. So I plugged in my earphones and downloaded a podcast and I was hooked. It was I was already sort of interested in climbing and its literature, but had no idea of what was out there to do with climbing in the podcast world. I've now come to realise that there's quite a few. The ones that I listened to and did listen to to start with, probably the first two actually, uh, probably the two biggest ones based in the US. The first one is the Enorma Cast, uh, which is pretty much about American climbing culture um, and a little bit of adventure. And then there's the Dirtbag Diaries, which is mainly adventure stuff with a bit of climbing thrown in. The Cutting Edge from the American Alpine Journal. Alpinist from the magazine. Um, for those of you that do listen and know about climbing stuff then you probably listened to those already and then I listened to it that brought me on to the UK stuff which I listened to Jam Crack podcast with Niall Grimes he's very funny I do like his kind of way that he does his it's quite unique there's also Factor 2 by Will Treasure um, which is really good um, and also The Curious Climber by Hazel Finley and I can't remember what her other co-host is Mina someone or Myra or Mira I can't quite know but those ones are kind of the major ones that I listen for and subscribe to and look forward to hearing every time when they come out I went along and I downloaded more and more shows uh, bringing me up to now um, I've got 16 climbing shows that I eagerly await its new episode every month or two weeks or however often it's out so I look forward to those and that I guess those ones kind of inspired me to do my uh, podcast up in the climbing world because I don't seem to think that there are any shows out there to do with climbing that just focus on climbing literature I mean you, every now and again you get an author that comes in um, and tells about their book but it's the show is not only about that so I thought I'd start up that here we are five episodes in I think um, it's great I really enjoy it since that June time that I listened started listening to climbing podcasts um, I, I've listened to the entire back catalogue of all the shows and it's a crazy amount that I've listened to I think it's around about a thousand episodes that is quite a lot of listening, but I do have the time to listen to them, and I'm very thankful that my job enables, enables me to to do that. Uh, moving on to my show, as we speak, I've just hit 100 downloads, which is incredible. I can't believe that you guys have listened to me. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button to listen out for more episodes. That's great. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So that's an update on my show. And that from then, uh, or from now rather, I'll just go on to with this week's, this week's, this episode's book. First on the rope. The acclaimed English translation of the French fiction classic Premier de Corday by Roger Prison Roche. It's a tale about the harsh lives of mountain guides and their families in the French Alps in the 1920s and 30s. An ascent of Mont Blanc as porter with his uncle leaves young Pierre further convinced he wants to be a mountaineer, breathing the crisp, pure air and soaking up the splendour of the wild landscapes. But his family has other ideas. Chamonix is becoming ever more popular with tourists, wanting their thrills on the slopes, and they all need somewhere to stay. Running a hotel, however, is not Pierre's idea of fulfilment. Among the glittering peaks and desolate passes, wonderful sunsets and wild winds, tragedy strikes across the Vallée Blanche on the Drew, a brutal storm 
leaves sadness and destruction in its wake. Can the onset of spring and the hope it brings rebuild Pierre's passion for climbing? First on the rope epitomises the rhythm of mountain life. The clanking cowbells, the gurgling streams set against the formidable grandeur of the ice and rock. Equip yourself for an immersive and emotive experience in the high Alps. Roger Frison Roche was born in Paris in 1906 of Savoyard parents, moving to Chamonix and away from the city as soon as possible. He got a job in the tourist office and began in earnest the training for the Guide de Sainte Montagne, which he passed in 1930. He found his own rock climbing and mountaineering school and was active and successful in mountain races. He wrote articles on these events, becoming so popular that he was made editor-in-chief in 1935 and sent to Algiers, working on La Depeche d'Algers. He also began to write a serial about the life of a young alpine guide for weekly instalments in the paper. These were put together to form Premier de Corday, first on the rope, the book that took him to fame. Frison Roche travelled widely during the war and a correspondent joined the resistance in the Savoyard region. He later became obsessed with the landscapes of the desert and the Arctic, after many trips to the Sahara and to stay with the Inuit, which became the subject matter of many of his subsequent books, as well as his beloved mountains. After having lived around the world and in various parts in France, in 1960 he moved back to his hometown of Chamonix, soon after to be elected president of the Union Internationale de Guide de Montagne. Roger Frison Roche died on the 17th of December 1999 in Chamonix. So this book um, is obviously set in the 1920s and 30s. It's not very often that you come across a mountaineering book that is a story. It's kind of based on some of his experiences and things. And I guess because he was a mountaineer, he understood the kind of language of or the naming of certain things that you use to climb with and the types of mountain formations and all that sort of stuff. In the front of the book, there's like a very quick glossary of what a few things mean. But um, I think if you picked up the book and not known what these things were, you could always flick back to the front and just to make sure you can kind of picture it in your mind and understand what he was talking about. I'm now going to do a kind of short uh, little read from the book if I can find it again. I did choose something but it looks like I've lost it but uh, where is it now? I've got to try and find it now. This is a bit silly isn't it really? Um, ah here we are yes. Just a, just a sort of snippet of his style of writing. The kitchen was a big square room, low-roofed and built entirely of wood. A narrow window with double glass and one adjustable pane let in some air without admitting too much cold. The Aguille Noir de Petere and the Dames Anglaises were framed in it, as if a painter had arranged the composition, and at this late hour, through it, had been long dark in the valleys, the tops were still faintly illuminated from behind by a pearly light that clung to the crests and lit up the curving cornices. Although everything was carefully shut, a chilly draught blew through the kitchen and round the living room, and the window panes were decorated with a pattern of frost. So, obviously, he's a very descriptive writer. Some of the descriptions can get a bit lengthy, but but that's just the kind of style of writing that they had in those days. I'm just looking for another kind of passage. Yeah, this one here. Four in the morning, three ghostly figures stole out of the hut with lighted lanterns. To save their fingers from frostbite on the icy saddle of the coal, they had put up the rope in the hut, and now walked up quickly and silently, careful not to slip on the icy path. Camille Lautier went up first, confidently picking out the line of the narrow track. Ravenat came last, keeping a sharp eye on Pierre, who had wakened limp and miserable, and was now walking along, mechanically, occasionally stumbling against the loose stones of the edge of the ridge and striking sparks with his, with his boot nails from the rocks. The icy wind which met them on the col put out Lautier's lantern. He lit it again, and his ears were freezing. He took the opportunity of, of the halt to put the helmet down over his neck. The three men broke into a long stride down the great waste of ice and snow on the French side, 
cutting straight across the base of the jante. They came down a long, slithering steps by the flickering light of the lantern, beside the vierge, where the slope steepens. They did a standing glissade. Leaning on the heads of their axes, they got up enough pace to take them with a jump, right over the last crevasse before the plateau. So these are the kind of guide. These these guides are apart from little, not little Pierre, but the kind of main character Pierre, who is longing to be a mountaineer, is just on his way to do a rescue of somebody who's died on the Drew, and they're just obviously working their way up to the Drew, and they'll be met by other people, by the other guides that were in the hut at the time. And just a kind of, not side note, but a kind of an extra thing is that some of the language that is used in this book, because it was written so long ago, it just, some of the language just wouldn't be used nowadays. It just sounds, almost sounds quite funny. Yeah, okay. Ball made fast a rappel line and flicked the ends down. One by one, the others climbed up to join him and Fernand on their airy platform. And there they held a council of war. So obviously, this holding a council of war is obviously a good description of they're discussing how to attack this next pitch of how to get up this thing. It's just just funny to hear a council of war. It's just really nicely um, a nice descriptive thing. You don't really need to think about it too much. You know exactly what they're um, what they're thinking of. There's another one as well which I just can't quite find. I'm just flicking through the book now just to try and find it. It was just really funny. It's almost like a funny bit in the in the book. Um, it was one of the guides after coming down from the rescue later in the book um, injures his foot um, and it doesn't go very well and he goes to hospital um, and is all the mountaineers and guides come to see him to visit him in hospital to see how it's how it's getting on um, off oh, here it is yes okay um, it's just a really funny turn of phrase um, at the end of it which just wouldn't be used today it's just quite funny one of the guys asked um, has it healed up asked ball for the sake of saying something nearly but with these special boots I don't feel a thing did they amputate your foot at the, at the heel? asked Fernand. Not quite as far back, but nearly. They evened it up. The surgeon told me. Uh, they took my bones out all right. Can you walk then? Just take a look at me. And tossing down his stick, George cut a spirited caper. So <laughs> it's it's quite funny, just cutting a spirited caper. It means, look how good I'm walking, you know. Um, it just again it just wouldn't be used nowadays it would be such an old-fashioned turn of phrase but it's great it's this this book is really beautifully written and it really describes how life was in you know sort of 80 90 years ago I guess in the 20s and 30s and there's also a kind of funny or the kind of funniest bit in the book um, is when the cows walk through the villages to get up into the Alp and each of the people that own a certain amount of cows, they have a queen of cows, and they eventually had to have a fight against other queens, which I had no idea whether that's true or not, I don't know. It might just be elaborated with the book. But it's just a funny thing to have cows fighting to see who can be the head of the herd. It's just really funny. Um, but to read it all, you'd have to pick up the book, and, and, and it's, just, it's, it's just a great book. It's really nicely written. I haven't... Um, almost almost finished the book now i'm on you know there's about i think about 50 pages left so i don't quite know how it's going to work out and how what if pierre's going to be a mountaineer or not um but i look forward to reading the rest of it and i really do hope that you pick it up in a shop or order it from uh, the publisher um, actually it's just a mention um, it's published by vertebrate publishing you can click on their link to find the book in the show notes they do all sorts of mountaineering literature and mountain biking and guidebooks it's a great company publishing i think a lot of people are going to them now in the uk um, i think they're based in sheffield for the uk listeners out there as it's such a 
a mecca, I guess, of climbing place, but what a place to have your publishing company. But yeah, give him, give them a look. Click on the link on the show notes and it should take you to the book on their site and you can pick up a copy there or just go to a bookshop um, and just have a quick read of it. Um, you won't be disappointed. I hope that you enjoyed this episode and it inspires you to go and buy the book. And don't forget to click on the link in the show notes that will take you straight to the book um, and you can buy it for Vertebrate Publishing. And you've been listening to Climbing on the Bookshelf. Thank you.